So, uh, so again, what I'm going to talk about is a, I would call it like a foundations talk, trying to, to look at, at what it is, uh, or, or what are the mechanisms inside deep learning that actually makes it tick, makes it work. Uh, and the, 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 what we're going to see is, is it's geometry. It's, there's just some very interesting geometrical properties of deep networks that, that make them more explainable, make them more interpretable, and potentially for your purposes, make them more easily applied or more gainfully applied in you know, a range of different areas, right? As models, not just for solving the kind of approximation problems we're gonna talk about today, but more higher level type uh, problems. Okay, so hopefully there'll be something in this talk uh, for everybody. And to summarize kind of in one, in one slide, uh, if you, if you, there's been a, uh, you know, tremendous growth uh, over uh, the ages uh, of, of uh, uh, mathematical uh, uh, development, mathematical expertise. Uh, one might argue that it reached its peak with the development of approximation theory over the last decades. And now we're, we're headed back down the other side of that, uh, the other side of that curve. And so the, the really in a, in a nutshell, the idea today is to look at how some of these ideas from approximation and in particular spline functions can impact our understanding of, of deep networks. Okay. So we're talking about function approximation today. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, let, 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 let's talk about it. So we're given, uh, in, in a function approximation problem, there, there is a, some unknown function or operator f. And what f does is it maps data uh, inputs, uh, uh, for example, a picture uh, or a, a time signal, and it maps that to some output, right? And in, in machine learning lingo, we tend to call x the data and we call y the labels, right? But, but if, it, if you're a systems type person, it's just the input uh, and the output. Of course, f is not available to us uh, in a lot of applications. Uh, and so we, we want to, what we wanna do is we wanna learn an approximation to f or make an inference about, we wanna do two things at once. First, learn about f and also learn an approximation to f using training data. So the idea is, we might not know F, but we know a bunch. If you look in the bottom right corner, we have a bunch of training data pairs, right? Certain X's that when put into this F give us out the corresponding Y. What we'd like to do is use those data points to infer an approximation to F that's parameterized by some kind of uh, parameter vector theta, right? And this is the kind of thing that you do all, everybody does all the time. Anytime they do a linear regression, for example, fit a straight line to some data. Uh, this is what, uh, this is the, the model that you're adopting. Uh, and it's the exact same model with, with uh, deep learning. So the, uh, if you think in terms of uh, people are maybe really familiar with re uh, regression type problems, well, you also solve function approximation problems when you do object classification. So the, the idea here is again, there's some system uh, that maps pictures on the left to labels about what the pictures are about on the right. And so given uh, a, a training data set of a whole bunch of input images, output labels, we'd like to infer the parameters of some approximation architecture so that when we put in a new data point, right, a picture of, let's say, Michael, the label actually comes out saying Michael, right? So hopefully this is uh, clear to everybody. And deep learning or deep networks are just the latest of uh, uh, architectures or approaches uh, to solve uh, this kind of problem. So uh, we're not going to do too much tutorial talking about deep learning, but, but uh, I really want to set up the the kinds of problems we're really interested in. Uh, and this is uh, uh, looking at solving these problems using uh, uh, deep learning. So what is deep learning? It's a hierarchy. The key thing is it's a hierarchical approach to solving function approximation problems, where the F theta is built up as a composition of a whole bunch of 
uh, simpler, right? Fs, right? F thetas, right? So we, and, and so the overall prediction uh, or approximation is, you know, the composition of a bunch of operators. And in deep learning, we give these, the, 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 the deep learning language, we call these layers, right? So for example, this uh, or pink layer here is uh, we, we do what's called, you know, convolution followed by a activation function. Then we do another layer, which is just another operator, uh, a pooling operator followed by another convolution operator, et cetera. Right. So that's the key thing is that we're just breaking this really hard, uh, what might be a really hard approximation problem into, into a composition of smaller ones. And now we can actually state the, the, the problem that my group is just very, very, uh, in, you know, interested in and focused on, and that is that uh, 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 deep deep networks are just so easy to, to describe locally, right? Uh, all they are, like state of the art networks today, all share the same basic building blocks, which are totally classical, totally understood, right? And the four or th actually three main building blocks are convolution, thresholding, and subsampling. So if you don't know, uh, if you haven't seen much about deep networks, here's what they are. But they're all operations you, you know about, right? Uh, for example, you might take an input image or an input signal, and then you do a convolution, which is simply a matrix multiplication, right? With a special matrix, right? A, a tuplets or a circulant matrix. And then you add a, a bias often to that output. Well, this is, you know, this has been around forever, right? This is just a simple affine transformation of your data. Nothing fancy there. Uh, the other fair, uh, very, very important transformation is simple thresholding. So uh, deep learning people might give it this uh, fancy sounding name ReLU to make it sound fancy, but in fact it isn't. It's just a thresholding operation. We just take a vector and we just operate on each entry in the vector, uh, asking if the if the entry is positive, we pass it through to the output. If the entry that, that's over here, and if the entry is negative, we just pass through a zero. So just thresholding. This again, totally classical. If you're a electrical engineer, this is the diode, right? So so very very easy to understand. Subsampling also very easy to understand. The whole idea of zooming out of a of an image or signal. Uh, so taking a image or signal at a certain resolution and then creating a likeness at a lower resolution. And you could do this linearly. You could do this nonlinearly. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, engineers would call this subsampling or decimation. Uh, this is the same idea behind wavelets, for example, and multi-scale transforms. Uh, but of course, this is deep learning, so we can't call it that. We have to call it pooling. Right, I have to give it a different name, right? But again, these are just so easy to describe locally. And what uh, this also lets us just now state like the grand challenge, which is how, how is it that uh, these, these operations that comprise a deep network are so easy to describe locally, but then when you put a whole bunch of them together, compose them, it is not clear at all what is going on, right? So it's just not clear how to describe uh, in, in terms that are easy to understand or interpret, the global mapping from, let's say, input to output of a deep network, even though the individual little components are very, very simple to describe, right? So that's really the grand challenge that, that, that we're tackling. And, and, and we think it's important because what has happened is that because it's so hard to describe what goes on globally, uh, practitioners and even researchers tend to treat deep networks as a black box. What does that mean? That just means that, that they, treat, uh, they treat the input to output mapping of this approximation as just an you know, a, a complicated operator with a, a zillion parameters. And then they just say, well, this is a useful approximation. I can't interpret it, but it's useful. And so I'm just gonna optimize those parameters to solve some, some task, right? And why, uh, you know, this has really helped the field progress empirically, right? Treating deep nets as black boxes. Uh, 
And, and this has led, uh, you know, many of us, right, to think that there's something going on here, right, and that perhaps deep nets are taking us to some higher intellectual plane that we wouldn't have been on otherwise. They, you know, in all honesty, they just remain, you know, mysterious and inscrutable. Uh, and, and what we need to do is to, to really make a more headway on the foundations, right, of what, what is going on inside these networks. And so the approach that we're going to talk about today is, is to link what's going on in a deep network with something very, a, a, a standard applied math and engineering tool called spline approximation that uh, I think can give a lot of insights into what's going on in a deep net. Okay, so let's talk about splines. I, uh, oh, and I'll, just before we do, let me just mention that, you know, we're not the only people thinking about splines and deep nets. Uh, there's a, you know, community of us. Um, I think one of the thing that uh, distinguishes our work from some of this other work is that we're trying to really grapple with splines in high dimensions. So for real deep networks, instead of thinking about, you know, low dimensional uh, type problems. Okay, so, but there's a lot of interesting work going on uh, in this space. So what is a spline? Uh, it's just a continuous, in our case, right? Uh, the audacious claim that I can make, it's not audacious actually at all, it's just true, is that all of the deep nets that are used today that use piecewise, uh, piecewise linear activation functions, for example, the ReLU, okay, activation function, these are all, CPA splines. What does that mean? Continuous piecewise affine mappings. So what? what so let's. Do, what, what does that mean? That means we're we're interested. Let's say in approximating this dark blue function, this nice smooth dark blue function in the background, and we're going to approximate it with three linear pieces. Right. Well, I don't use the term linear because they're really affine pieces because there's a you know they're. A, they're, they're offset from the, the axis. And so, so we see that we have a, 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 a linear or an affine piece here, this red piece, but then it, it transitions to a green piece uh, at this orange dot, which is called the knot of the spline, uh, and then transitions to this blue piece. Okay, so uh, probably everybody here has played around with splines uh, at some point. They're just used everywhere. Uh, like if you own a, uh just about well anything that is manufactured the the shape was was designed using splines for example the body of a car was designed using splines wavelets are splines they just come up all over the place so uh wh wh why do we call them piecewise uh cpa because first of all they what they do is they're they're a piecewise approximation because they they use affine pieces right to put together the the approximation and these pieces are continuous they actually mate up okay uh, so now I want to bring the other really crucial uh, idea about splines crucial for the entire rest of the talk and that is there's a uh, 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 there's a yin uh, a yin yang um, a relationship between the approximation by a spline and the partition of the independent variable right this x variable which we call the data in, in the machine learning problem, namely that uh, uh, e over each of these, uh, for example, this red, green, and blue portions that we're using to approximate this smooth function, oops, you see that we are partitioning this line into three regions, a red region, a green region, and a blue region, okay, and this is going to be very, very important for later, right? So, um, how do you do a spline approximation? Well, you could argue that the first thing you do is partition the x-axis. And then once you partition the x-axis, you just fit an affine function on each of those pieces. Uh, and then you make sure that they line up. That's a CPA spline. So uh, without going into any fancy statement, theorem statements, uh, the bottom line is that each layer of a deep network is in fact a spline operator. It's an, it, it is one of these CPA spline operators. And in fact, an entire deep network, since it's a composition of splines, it is itself a spline, right? Uh, moreover, what you can show is that in 
in uh, this example back here, we are in one dimensional space where the partition uh, uh, regions the re, uh, were basically intervals on the line. What, uh, what you can show is that in, in higher dimensional space, here's a picture in 2D, and we'll keep talking about it in 2D for a minute, uh, but in, in, in you know, an arbitrary input dimension, the spline partition is actually something called a hyperplane arrangement. Okay, what, it, what I mean by that is that the, the partition of the uh, input space or the data space is formed by a collection of cuts, right? A collection of hyperplanes, okay? And in 2D, these hyperplanes are just one dimensional lines, okay, for this 2D example. Uh, basically, you, the spline uh, uh, partition of a, of a deep network is basically you have a 2D plane and you throw down, right? You throw down a bunch of one dimensional lines. And then the, the regions are formed, right? Here are the regions that are formed by, uh, by the, 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 the boundaries that are these lines, right? And so you can see that we, by throwing down this handful uh, of two, 1D lines in this two dimensional space, we have, you know, like a dozen or so little regions. And so the spline mapping in a deep network is basically going to be, we take a, a in this case, a plane, and we put a plane on each one of these uh, regions so that we have a, a, a piecewise a fine mapping. But, but where along each of these cuts, here, let me get my cursor, each one of these cuts, the planes have to actually match up. Okay, and we'll see more of this uh, in a second. And the neat thing about this is that this is, we're going to see that this gives us all kinds of interesting connections between deep networks and ideas that come out of information theory, computational geometry, statistics, ideas like uh, vector quantization, k-means Voronoi tiling. In particular, the, uh, you can think of a deep net as basically partitioning the input space and then uh, uh, basically think, uh, 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 representing all of the inputs that lie within one of these tiles uh, with a single code value. Right, a single code value, and then be, that we're going to be able to talk about like the complexity of our input signal space uh, based on the richness of those code values. So more about this uh, later. So let me just be really kind of clear, hopefully clear, by doing a, an example, a really uh, uh, simple example in two dimensions of a toy deep network. Uh, and it is a three layer network that we have here. It maps a two dimensional input space. Why two dimensional? Well, two dimensional so we can actually visualize what's going on. It then, there's a matrix multiplication then. It's not even a, it's not even a convolution matrix, just a regular full matrix. It has, it has 45 rows, two columns that takes us to 45 dimensional space. Uh, and then what we do is we pass the output of that matrix multiplication through a ReLU, through a thresholding operation, to create a 45-dimensional representation. Then we go from 45D to three dimensions, okay, to get to this uh, second layer. And then from that, uh, again, by matrix multiplication followed by uh, 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 thresholding operation. And then finally, one last operation to go from 3D to 4D through, don't worry about it, but a more jargon, uh, basically a multinomial logistic regression mapping, which is, you can't call it that because this is deep learning. You have to call it something new. So we call it soft max. Uh, and to get a four dimensional output. And it's 4D because we're going to solve a four dimensional classification problem. Okay, so the input's 2D, output is 4D. Let's look at the training data. So the input is 2D, so the points are just in the, the training data points X are just in the plane. You see here we have four classes, green, red, blue, and cyan. What we want to do is learn the parameters of this network. What are the parameters? The only parameters are the um, entries in these matrices, right? And I actually forgot to mention, uh, forgot to mention that after we do the matrix multiplication, we add a bias, right? And then go through uh, the thresholding operation. So all we have are these 
biases that we're adding, these matrix parameters. And we're going to try to learn all of these parameters using, you know, this is not a talk on optimization. We're just going to out of the, we're just going to learn these parameters using stochastic gradient descent. Doesn't matter if you aren't familiar with that. We're just going to learn them in some way. We're going to assume they're fixed. And now we're just going to look at actually what is going on in a deep network what, once you have these fixed parameters. Okay, so let's look at the mapping from the input to the output of this first layer. So the output of the first layer looks like this. And, and this is the result of uh, basically throwing 45 lines. There's 45 nodes or neurons at the second layer. So there are 45 straight lines that we have thrown down in the plane, right? Thrown down in the plane. Uh, uh, and, you know, these would be thrown down randomly initially, but then by optimization, you would tune the angle and offset of these lines. And, and what these lines do is they start to form regions, right? They form regions. And it turns out these are, all of these regions are convex, okay? Which is something you can show. Uh, if they don't look convex in this picture, it's only because I like to use a really old, I just love this picture. Uh, it's very old. And there's all kinds of aliasing artifacts in how we Randall and uh, created this picture. I still like to show it though. Uh, so anything that doesn't look convex, it's just because we didn't sample the, the XY plane densely enough to, 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 to show up uh, the convexity of the regions. Okay, And so we see that the first layer mapping of a deep net has chopped up the input space into a whole bunch of convex regions. Okay, uh, but remember it's a spline. This is just the first part. The 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 yin part uh, uh, um, of our of our representation. The partitioning of the independent variable. Now we need to do the spline mapping, and what that means is that on each one of these tiles, on each one of these tiles, we need to fit uh, matrix A and a we don't fit we have fit there exists a matrix a and an offset vector b that correspond to the affine mapping that now defines the input output mapping of this first layer right and so i i uh yeah i uh, if our point x uh uh our data point fell into this particular tile right this particular tile of our uh two-dimensional space then there would be one matrix A and one offset vector B that would be applied to this X in order to compute the output for that particular X. Moreover, we would use that same A and B for every input that falls into this tile of this uh, uh, part of the input space, right? So this is the spline approximation aspect of this mapping from the input to the output. Uh, of the first layer. Hopefully this makes sense. Makes sense to everybody? Hopefully. Okay, so now let's look to go through to the, the next layer, right? To the output of the second layer. And now things continue to be, get more and more interesting because now we'll, we'll talk more about a couple minutes about this in more detail. Now we've thrown down a bunch more lines, right? In two dimensional space and those lines interact with the previous lines to create a new set of even finer regions. Okay, so this is the this is the tiling in space or the partition in space uh, after going through two layers of this deep network. Uh, again, the, the the regions remain convex. So if they don't look convex, it's just again because of a sampling artifact. Uh, and um, again, you see that if we um, uh, again, if we have now going through two layers of this network, the first layer and the second layer, let's say that uh, an in, a, a particular input signal falls into this tile, uh, uh, meaning this region of the input uh, space, okay? Well, the, again, there will be an A and there will be a B, you could like look them up from a table, that then would be applied to this X to get the output of the two-layer mapping through layer one and layer two, okay? And, and like I, I, I just said for the previous uh, uh, la single layer case, all, all inputs that lie in this tile will have this exact same A and B applied to them, right? And this is that, 
uh, idea of the spline piecewise a fine mapping something that doesn't come through uh looking at these pictures is you need to recall this really interesting uh, con uh constraint on this piecewise a fine mapping that there's an a and a b right and a fine transformation for this particular region there is an affine transformation, a different one for this region, okay? But these two affine transformations have this really interesting property, okay? That for, they are the same along, okay? F along this line that defines the boundary between those two regions, okay? Because the, the planes have to actually match up, right? Along that line, okay? And this is the continuous property of this CPA spline mapping, right? And in fact, I would argue that this is the really interesting thing to study because this, this, this is not an arbitrary piecewise affine mapping. As soon as you impose continuity on this mapping, uh, it is incredibly constrained, okay? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, about that uh, later in the talk. Okay? Hey, uh, Dr. Barnier, yeah. can I just clarify something real quick? Yeah. So in the case of a ray, uh, in the case of ray activation functions, do these lines essentially just correspond to where the function equals zero? Exactly. And I should have really said that. Okay, got it. I should have really said that. Let's just go back here, right? I, I should have really said that. Let, let, let me say it because if you're asking, I, yeah, I should be clear. Where do these lines come from, right? Well, these lines come from uh, basically... Uh, each, each line is associated with one, okay, we have a mapping of, let's say, one, one layer, input to output. We have a number of units or neurons at the output, okay? Each line corresponds to one of those, uh, one of those output, let's call them neurons, right? Okay, and so the line corresponds to the, what is the angle and offset of the line? Nothing other than the entries in the weight matrix and the bias that are added to that weight matrix before the ReLU, okay? So as you change the weights in the network and the biases in the network, these lines will rotate and shift, okay? And then what happens is for this particular neuron, uh, what will happen is on this side of that line, you when you put those Xs in, to that affine transformation, you will get a positive number, right, at that particular entry. So this is where the ReLU output is positive, and this is where the ReLU output is zero. It's exactly like you were saying, right? And so that's what builds up this hyperplane arrangement, are these rotated uh, uh, lines in two-dimensional, two dimensions that are uh, induced by the weights and the biases of the network, and then this ReLU activation, uh, positive and zero uh, sides. That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Let's keep going. So you can, act, and you can start to see here after two layers that we start to have really interesting uh, partition boundaries. Just look up here, right? That are starting to help you delineate, right? This region is, is like a, a green points inside it, right? This region is red points inside it, right? So even for such a simple network, you can see uh, the, the, this partition starting to uh, like align uh, with your data. Okay, so this is what goes on uh, after two layers uh, in the network. Uh, and that, that's all we need to do to really just give you an idea of, of what's going on, not just uh, in 2D, but now to use your intuition in higher D. You can also study uh, if you're interested in optimization and, and gradient stochastic gradient descent learning, uh, you can you can actually study how the, this tiling evolves over training epochs. So uh, this is an initialization on the left and typically networks are initialized with uh, uh, random weights in the weight matrices uh, and zero biases. So that's why we basically get a collection of cones in the uh, input space. And then what we see as we, as we move through training uh, epochs is these cones starting to do two things. They, well, they're, they're starting to pull away from the origin and become thinner and, and wider, 
such that as all of these cones intersect with each other, we create uh, a, a tiling that focuses more and more on right, the, the data, right? More and more forming these interesting regions uh, uh, in the data. So, and this doesn't just apply in 2D input. This, if you have, you know, million dimensional input images, the exact same thing uh, is going on, okay? So, so hopefully this gives you a, a feeling uh, like an intuition in low D. What I'd like to do now is just, you know, talk about some of the things that we've been able to, to prove or and understand about these tilings and then talk about some, some, you know, some applications of these uh, ideas. So the first thing that, that, uh, uh, that we've been able to establish is that these, the, the geometry of the spline partition tilings of the input space are really, really rich, really, really rich. And they, they, they derive from what's called a subdivision process. People are familiar with subdivision, divide and conquer like process. Think of a wavelet like representation or a, a dog, like difference of Gaussian type visual representation. The same kind of thing is going on uh, in a deep network. Uh, and it turns out that you can prove that, that uh, a deep network that is, is built up using uh, building blocks that are piecewise affine, ReLUs, convolutions, biases, poolings. Uh, it turns out that the, the, uh, um, uh, the resulting uh, uh, tiling of the input space is always going to be what's called a power diagram. And a power diagram is a less familiar version of something you're probably very familiar with, which is a Voronoi tiling. So what is a Voronoi tiling? A Voronoi tiling is where you are interested in tiling a space uh, and you have an, a, a collection of centroids, these little dots here. And to create a Voronoi tiling, what you do is you say, I wanna associate points in the plane with the centroid that they are closest to. Okay, so that's a Voronoi tiling. Uh, it turns out the boundaries that, that delineate which points associated with which centroids are straight lines. Okay, so here it would be uh, the example of like a Voronoi type uh, tiling. Uh, and so this is a, a key idea that comes up in computational uh, geometry. It's also the same as k-means clustering. If you've ever done k-means clustering, in k-means clustering, you basically say, I try to find a collection of centroids from some data, and then those clusters are going to essentially be the Voronoi cells, the, the points that associate with those particular centroids, right? So there's this connection between k-means and Voronoi. Turns out deep nets don't implement exactly Voronoi tilings. They implement something that's a slight generalization, they do everything I just talked about, except that in addition to having a collection of centroids that are learned from the data, there are a collection of radii that are learned from the data. And you can think of these radii uh, as each radius is associated with a centroid, and it basically warps the local geometry of the Voronoi tiling, allowing it a given centroid to capture more real estate uh, than the, maybe than, than others, okay? Uh, and you know we don't really need to go into more details about that, but but there's a rich uh, uh, theory around power diagrams that we can now directly apply to learn, understanding more about uh, what's going on uh, in deep learning. And in particular, there are you can develop closed form formulas given a big architecture of a deep network. There are closed form formulae for these centroids and for the radii in terms of the parameters uh, of the deep network. So you can do a lot of analytical work uh, understanding these, uh, this, this, this geometry, okay? Uh, moreover, I already mentioned this, but uh, this, these power diagrams, uh, when you concatenate multiple layers or compose multiple layers, uh, let's say we compose uh, uh, two layers together. Uh, well, the, the, remember I said that the input to uh, the output of the first layer is a CPA spline, but so is the mapping from the input to the output of the second layer. It's also a CPA spline. And it turns out that the, the 
the the the um, spline partition in the input space will be the combination of the two spline partitions from layer one and layer two. And we can actually understand a lot about how that app actually happens. And it's it's what's called a subdivision process. Think like wavelets, uh, quad tree, uh, cutting uh, of, of an input space. Um, and, and it basically works like follows, as follows. So let's say we're again in a simple uh, two-dimensional uh, input space so that we can visualize things. And let's say that the first layer of our network goes uh, from two-dimensional input space to a six-dimensional output, okay? Six-dimensional output. Well, there's six outputs, so there will be six straight lines that are thrown down in this two-dimensional input space that will divide up the space into a collection of regions, right? So now what happens when we go through the second layer? Okay, well, if, if you just think of the second layer, at, uh, the input of the second layer to the output of the second layer, it will do the exact same thing. It's also gonna just throw down some cuts, okay? But now when you think about what happens, how these two layers interact, well, it's, it's really quite interesting. Okay, we can actually describe the, the, the spline partition of the two layer network in very simple terms. Basically what will happen is that all of the, the hyperplane cuts from layer one will exist in the spline partition of the two layer network. These are in gray here. But then what will happen is the second layer has added additional cuts, okay? But what we need to do is take those straight line cuts that are formed by layer two and we need to like pull them back through layer one and that causes them to bend or fold. Okay, and so what will happen is it will have in black here a number of new cuts that are formed from this second layer. Okay, this second layer. Uh, there's four of them that are uh, 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 coming down here. And basically you can see that when one of these black cuts from this uh, layer two intersects with a cut from layer one, it actually will fold. And why does it fold? You might want to ask yourself why it folds. It folds precisely so that you can keep continuity of this operator, right? So, so layer one uh, 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 operator is continuous, layer two operator is continuous. We need the composition of both to be continuous. And what that does is it forces the, 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 the partition regions to kind of deform so that you can have continuity of this overall operator. And it's really neat that we can actually calculate that, for example, the dihedral angles of these folds, right, which tells us a lot about the, uh, some of the properties of this uh, tiling, which we'll, we'll get to, uh, get to uh, next here. So if you think about a classification network, let's say that this is a, a three layer, a, a three layer network where we were interested in taking two dimensional inputs and then just classifying as uh, this, the input is from class one or class two. Well, it turns out that that last final layer basically will be a single hyperplane cut. It'll be a single hyperplane cut. And on one side, you're class one, on the other side, you're class zero. Okay, but pulling that cut through the previous two layers, it is gonna bend or, or fold, okay? And so uh, this, is, this is how you get a very uh, uh, rich, uh, complicated decision boundary, even after just a few, uh, uh, even just after a few uh, uh, previous layers, Something as simple as a linear classifier at the final layer, pulling that linear classification decision back through the network creates a highly complex, right? Highly complex uh, decision surface, right? Or classification boundary. And the, the really neat thing is that if, if you are interested in studying generalization performance of uh, a classifier, then what you're very interested in, for example, is the smoothness of this decision boundary. That's an important param, uh, attribute of a decision surface to see are you really overfitting or not overfitting. 
And then the neat thing about this theory we're developing is that we're actually able to talk about that, say a lot about the smoothness, because we're able to compute all of these dihedral angles, right, of the decision boundary every time it needs to fold at one of these when it passes through an earlier layer hyperplane cut, right? So we can really say a lot about uh, smoothness of the boundary and how it's impacted by the data and then by that is then in, uh, causing the formation of these uh, uh, earlier layer spline partition boundaries, right? So hopefully that gives you kind of a feeling of one of the directions of you know, the, the theoretical development that we're, that we're uh, working in. Uh, uh, let me give some more examples of what, how we can apply uh, this, this, uh, the, the spline ideas, both to understand what's going on in deep networks, to be able to make them more interpretable, and also to be able to you know, help make them better. So, so, uh, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is, is an interpretation of, of these local affine mappings in a, a, a deep network. And let's think about a you know, convolutional neural network. That's like a bread and butter uh, deep net. I've, I've been mentioning several times that we have closed formulas for things. Well, it turns out here is uh, rather large, but the closed form formula for the overall affine mapping from the input to the output of a convolutional neural network. Okay. And it's, it, uh, it remember, that the overall affine mapping, overall mapping from the input to the output is an affine mapping, but where the affine parameters change based on where you are uh, in the, the input space, right? And so we can actually calculate what that, uh, uh, the affine trans, the, 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 the slopes part, if you will, of the affine transformation is in terms of uh, the weights of the network, and then some, uh, the convolution matrices uh, in the network, and then some, uh, some parameters based on the pooling and uh, the uh, pooling and activation operators. And then we can also calculate the, the, the bias that is added uh, to the, the output, uh, because after all, an affine transformation has a slopes part and an offset or a biases part. Okay, so now we let's just study for a second. What are the entries of this big A matrix? What really are they? Okay, what are they? Well, let's think in terms of a uh, let's think in terms of a, a a simple classification problem, right? Uh, and so just to make everything again really oops really clear, uh, we we the the deep network is is partitioning our input space for every uh, input X it falls in a given tile, a region of that input space. There's an, uh, a matrix A of slopes and a vector B of offsets, right, that are uh, applied to X in order to compute the output. Not just that X, but all the X's in this region. Okay, all the X's in this region. And now we can just say, given this X, what are the entries in, what are the, what are the entries in A really tell us? Okay, well, let's Let's say that we're uh, in a four class classification problem, four classes. Well, that means that A will actually have four rows and a number of columns that's the same as the dimension of the input, okay? Uh, and so how do we compute the output? The output, let's forget about B for right now. Just forget about B, you can ask me about it later. Uh, how do we compute this output? Well, all we do is we multiply the matrix A by X. Well, how do you multiply a matrix by a vector? If everything's real, the seeth output is just going to be the seeth row. The seeth output here will just be the seeth row of A multiplied by X, right? Well, what is that? That's an inner product. It's an inner product of the seeth row with the input X. And so what we can see is that the, the output here of our, of our deep network, right? The uh, uh, output at say the boat, uh, the, the boat output, will be the inner product between the input X and some matched filter, some filter, some, some row of an A matrix that, that uh, when multiplied by X creates some number at the output, right? And the reason I call it match filter is that the way you use a deep network is you interpret this like a, 
an unnormalized or normalized probability distribution, you put in an input and you decide which class that input came from by whichever output is biggest. Okay, and this whole idea of designing a linear system or an affine system so that when uh, the output is maximized when an input of a certain type is, is put at the input, that's known as a match filter bank, right? And this is totally classical from, uh, totally classical from uh, you know, signal processing. Uh, it, it's what is inside a radar. It's what's in, inside a sonar when you're searching for, for a target. And basically what the theory of match filtering tells us is that uh, the way to maximize this boat output when, this get, when a picture of boats is put in is what? It's saying that seeth row, that's boat, should actually kind of look like a boat. Okay, because by Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, the inner product is between two vectors is maximized when they're the same. Right, it's minimized when they're orthogonal. And this is in fact exactly what we see when we look at uh, you know, real data examples. So here's like from the CIFAR uh, data set. It's just a, a little clips of simple images. Here's an input from the airplane class. It's not a boat, it's an airplane. And here are the rows of the A matrix corresponding to the airplane channel. And you see if you kind of squint, kind of looks like an airplane and you get a big inner product, right? Uh, ship and dog channels, they don't exactly look like ships and dogs because it's actually more effective if you know that this is not a ship to actually try and be an anti-airplane, right? An anti-airplane. So we get, you see that we get small inner products from those particular, uh, particular channels, right? And so that, that lets us uh, uh, give new interpretation of what, you know, folks have studied in the past empirically calling saliency maps, actually being able to look at these and say, wow, there's a real classical optimality to, to deep networks in that they are a signal, uh, a signal dependent or signal adaptive matched filter bank, which is exactly what's inside radar, sonar, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, et cetera, right? So hopefully that, uh, hopefully that makes uh, some sense. Let's look at uh, last couple examples. Uh, let's turn our attention to a whole different class of uh, uh, deep networks that are not used to go from high dimension to low dimension, just to classify. Let's look at networks that go from a low dimension to a high dimension to synthesize, right? To synthesize. And these are so-called deep generative models. And what they do is they go from a, a low dimensional input, uh, Z, this blue dot here, and they go through a network where all the matrices, instead of being a uh, small number of rows, lots of columns are lots of rows, small number of columns. And so they explode the dimension as you go through the network and they produce with a set of learned para uh, parameters, somewhat miraculously crazy synthesized images. And, and you know, everybody here, I'm sure has seen these images, uh, you know, whether it's pictures of people, pictures of natural scenes, this is a, this is a bedroom that doesn't exist right? It's, it's just synthesized from one of these networks, okay? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and basically by having a large library of bedroom images, right? And basically a learning a mapping from basically a, uh, 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 some probability distribution input that's really simple, for example, like just a spherical Gaussian, learning the parameters that when you pick a different Gaussian random vector value, you will get a different picture of a bedroom. Okay, and so, uh, so you know, these are, you know, extremely powerful synth synthesizing networks. Uh, and the, the you know, continuing challenge in this space is uh, how to actually learn, given a, a library of training data, how to actually learn these parameters theta. Okay, and this is a, uh, uh, 
much more difficult than in the classification uh, case. Uh, and there have been all kinds of voodoo methods that have been proposed to learn these parameters theta, like, for example, setting up a, a game using game theory ideas, like in a generative adversarial network. Okay. Uh, but these are very, very touchy uh, optimizations uh, 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 to actually do. And so we can actually make progress on coming up with better ways to find these uh, parameters theta. And the, the way to do it is by, uh, is, is to, to think about this as a probabilistic, a deep generative network as a probabilistic learning problem, okay? And, and using ideas from statistics. Uh, and there is, uh, there, there is a, a subset of folks in deep learning working on probabilistic deep generative models, okay? And the idea here, uh, let's just kind of dig a bit deeper than we had in the previous slide. The idea is that we have a, a network here that maps uh, an input distribution, input distribution to some, uh, oops, oops, to some output distribution. Okay, so the purpose of this generative model is to warp this spherical Gaussian distribution in low D to some non-spherical distribution in, in high D. Okay, and how do we know the shape of this distribution that we'd like? Well, it turns out there is a true distribution out there, the blue distribution that we'd like to, to match. We don't actually know the blue distribution, but we have samples from that blue distribution. For example, there's a true distribution, data distribution in high D space of a bedroom image. And we have a sampling of, you know, some tens of thousands of these images, these dots here. What we'd like to do is using these dots here, uh, we'd like to uh, basically uh, learn, right, the parameters, theta, that cause this green distribution to become closer to this blue distribution using these samples, right, that are the blue dots. And, and the way that this is done today, not talking too much about how it's done, but it's done with, you know, incredibly crude uh, approximations, basically marginal type approximations to these high dimensional distributions. And the sort of best performing methods out there are so-called variational autoencoders that, that make these crude uh, approximations. And they work fine when you have uh, lots and lots and lots of data, but when you don't training data, but when you don't, they, they don't work uh, very well. Okay. And so the, what can we do in this space with what we're uh, uh, developing? Well, it turns out we can say quite a bit, right? We can say quite a bit. Uh, so what, what, what can we do? Well, oops, what we, what can we do is we have a, a here's our, uh, like an example of a generative, uh, network. You see it, it, it's going from a two-dimensional input to a higher three-dimensional output, right? Uh, just so we can visualize. Well, we, we know that since this is a, a, a network that's composed of matrix multiplications, addition of biases, ReLUs, uh, and operations like that, we know that the input to output mapping is a, a continuous piecewise affine spline. That means we know that what the, the spline does is it, it, it partitions the two-dimensional input space here into, right, a collection of regions, right, convex regions, okay? Uh, and now what it is doing, a, a little bit differently than in the, you know, classification, is that we also know that what is happening is that these 2D regions, okay, this, think of it, it, it like this, we basically have a flat piece of paper. We divided it into a bunch of regions with a bunch of, you know, ruler markings. And now what we're going to do is we're going to fold along each of those lines and what to form an origami. And that origami is going to be in three dimensional space because we folded, right? So they, we come out of the plane. Okay. But it's going to be an origami because it all started from one piece of paper, a 2D piece of paper. And so we're going to remain with a continuous surface in three dimensional space. And this surface is actually, you know, technically is a manifold. And so what we're going to have is a, a smooth 
piecewise affine manifold in this higher 3D dimensional space, right? And what's going on in a, in a real, like a bedroom synthesizing network is that the input space wouldn't be 2D, it would be 1000D. So we'd be in 1000D here, dividing it up. And then we'd be mapping it to, you know, 50,000D output. And so what we have is a 10,000 or a 1000 dimensional manifold in say 50,000 uh, dimensional space. And we know a lot about that manifold because we, we know the mappings, right? Of, of, of each of these individual pieces. So that means we have closed form formulas for this manifold. And so we can do way, we can apply uh, a much more uh, modern techniques for learning uh, this this green distribution, right? In particular, since we have analytical expression, yeah, uh, Dr. Bernier, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so we're we're uh, already running a bit over time, and I want to make sure there's some discussion time. So could uh, oh boy, uh, could we uh, could we wrap it up in uh, in a few minutes, and then so we have some question oh, time. Actually, I can wrap it up in I can wrap it up in one minute. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was I was I was having fun and and didn't I lost track of time. No, I actually uh, I, I I am totally having fun also. I'm on the same. Page. No, uh, this is good. This is good. So ba the bo bottom line is is that we have uh, if you think if you think of the input being a unit Gaussian random vector, and we know let's say everything about this this mapping to the high to this higher dimensional space, we actually have analytical expressions for all of the quantities that we we might need for learning, right? Uh, for example, the, the likelihood, right? The loss between these uh, two distributions and also the posterior distribution, if you think in terms of, of Bayesian type methods. And so what that allows us to do is apply classical learning ideas like EM algorithm, right? In order to learn this green distribution. And the great thing about this EM algorithm is it's, gr it's gradient free. Right, so it's an analytical. Uh, we just have analytical expressions for the expectation and the maximization steps. So it's gradient free, closed form expressions, and we have guaranteed convergence. So really, it's hard to ask for for more. Moreover, the performance when you have small amounts of data, which is where VAE and other methods start to fail, is like v very high. Right, so just two a quick example here on the left. Here's a data distribution we're trying to learn uh, in, in 2D. Uh, and here's the distribution that is learned by standard techniques, right? Standard deep learning techniques. And here is the method or, or the output learned by this uh, EM technique. And you can really clearly see in both these cases, this piecewise, right, a fine property because of the piecewise affinity of this generative model. Right, so this is a, we've looked at two examples here. The first of match filtering that allows us to interpret what's going on in a deep network in terms of geometry and affine transformations. And then this is the flip side. This is saying, well, given these kind of insights, we can actually make deep learning higher performance, right? Not just understand it, but actually make it work better. Okay, so let me just let me just end by saying there's you know a lot of work that. Uh, you know, can be done in this space. We're really just scratching the surface. Uh, and the thing that I hope you'll take away uh, from this is that splines, and in particular, continuous piecewise affine splines, provide a really nice framework or a foundation on which to build you know, a theory, a real theory of, of, of deep learning. Okay, so with this, uh, I'll end and uh, hopefully time uh, for at least a few questions.